Good morning, Upstate Church, Harrison Bridge. I am so excited to be with you this morning. Uh, happy New Year's Eve and all those things, but maybe a holiday you didn't know of. This really is like happy like National Youth Pastor Sunday. Like I can almost guarantee you that at local churches all across the country, uh, campus pastors are leaving and the youth pastors are stepping in. So I'm pumped to be here. I will take any opportunity I can get. Um, like Kathy said, my name is Brandon. Uh, I'm in our residency program. I'm the student coordinator at our Five Forks campus. But really not that long ago, um, I was here as the student coordinator. And I, I love this place so much. I love the people who are here. And I love, even though I'm not here every Sunday, I get to hear reports of what God is doing here. Uh, me and Corey are really close. I look up to him a lot. It's been super encouraging to work with him these last few years in student ministry. Um, however, I guess that because today is December 31st, this is like last official day as the student director. Like I woke up this morning and he had left our group chat and I was like heartbroken. Like, bro, you didn't have to leave like ASAP. Um, but here's what I'm thinking. Like since today is his last day as student director, that means today is the last day he's responsible for our budget. And so I've been trying to think up, like, what could I just, like, outrageously spend money on while Corey is still responsible for it? And so if you have any ideas, this will all go on his card. He'll be blamed for it. I feel like this could be a real win for everybody here. So just send me some ideas if you have any. Um, but, yeah, I'm just excited to be here with you all this morning. And this week, coming out of the Christmas season, we're going to be looking at the only passage that talks about Jesus' childhood. And I think this is, there's no better time for this because again, on the one hand, like chronologically, this makes sense. We're talking about Jesus's birth, that narrative, and now this just goes right into it. But also, like we just talked about, in 2024, our campus pastors are gonna be starting to work through the book of Revelation. And I think, and I really believe in this series, we're just gonna get an awesome view of who Jesus is. One where he is just so worthy of all of our praise. One where he is just so victorious. And I think that this is going to give a lot of us hope. I mean, if you were just to turn, first of all, to Revelation 1, you'll get there next week. You're going to see descriptions of Jesus. Like he's got eyes like flames of fire. He's got white hair. He's got the tongue like a two-edged sword. And first of all, I'm like, that's so sick. I'm like, that is awesome. Like kind of goosebumps. I don't know. But also like there's so much hope to be found here in a Jesus like that. However, this is, this is like my biggest fear in that. In seeing that perspective of Jesus, one where he is so big, so great, so mighty, I think the lie that is gonna creep into our hearts and minds is a lie that says a Jesus like that, I really can't get to know him. Like I think that's the greatest lie the enemy can throw at us. That God, yeah, he's creator, he's a great ruler, he's a great king, but I really can't know him. He's impersonal. And so before we even get into 2024, before we start working through this side of Jesus, I think we all just need that reminder. That the same Jesus we're going to read about is the same Jesus that says, I no longer call them servants, I call them friends. Like this is Jesus. We can know him. And so I believe this text is going to help set a good foundation for that. So if you have your Bibles, we'll be in Luke chapter 2 this morning. We're going to start reading in verse number 41. Again, this is the only thing we have on Jesus' childhood. Like from him as a baby to him when he starts his public ministry at the age of 30. This is the only text we have. And that's kind of crazy to think about. Like, the most famous, most influential person to ever walk on the face of the earth. This is what we have about his childhood. However, I think we believe that the scriptures are, are sufficient and this is what we need to see about childhood Jesus. And so we're gonna start reading it together in verse number 41. It says this, now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up according to custom. And when the feast was ended, as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. 
His parents did not know it, but supposing him to be in the group, they went a day's journey, but they began to search for him among their relatives and acquaintances. And when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem searching for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and answers. And when his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. And he said to them, why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? And they did not understand the saying that he spoke to them. And when he went down with them, he came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. And his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. I'm gonna pray for us and then we can dive into the text. Jesus, we love you so much and just so thankful for who you are. God, I'm praying for every heart in this place this morning that we would just see such a a clear picture of Jesus, but also God, that, that we would see a Jesus that is worth knowing. God, if we've never started following you, I pray this is that morning. God, if we're far from you, I pray that this would be the year that we go deeper and that we know you more, God. We love you. Have your way in this place. We ask this in your son, Jesus Christ's name, amen. So very very simply this morning, as we read this text, there are two responses in seeing this. The first one is that we have to know Christ. Like we have to know the Jesus that this text is talking about. So up until this point, the first two chapters in Luke, everything that we have read would have been begging the reader to ask this one question. Like, who is this Jesus? Like, imagine you're you're reading. You're like, who is this Jesus that was born in a place like Nazareth where no one good comes from, yet at the same time, like when he's born, the angels just cry out glory to God in the highest. Like, who is this Jesus that answers all the prophecies of a coming Messiah? But still, there was no room for him in the end. They've been wondering, who who is this? Like, who is this Jesus that he's talking about? Then we get into this text, and we even get further into the weeds of the person of Jesus. This foundation, kind of answering the questions about his essence. Because on the one hand, who is this boy who can just walk into a temple with the wisest and smartest people around and just leave them all in amazement at his answers? Who is this Jesus that says, why, where have you been? He's like, I must be in my father's house. But then right after, it says he submitted to his parents and that he still needed to grow in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. Man, we're wondering who, who is this Jesus that's been talked about so far? And again, in a fascinating story like this, we learn a lot. Just, just again, to recap, every year, people would have traveled from their hometown to Jerusalem to celebrate the feast of Passover. And so I think like large crews of family and friends, they have all traveled together in one caravan. They'd have stayed the whole week celebrating this. And then they'd all go back together. So it was no surprise that Mary and Joseph just assumed that Jesus was like somewhere in the squad of people making their way back to Nazareth. However, he indeed was not. So I just have a random question, like parents in the room. How many of y'all have ever left your kid at school or church? I'm just very curious. Anybody brave enough to say it? Okay, there's a few. Love the honesty here. That was always my dream as a kid, all right? I'm like sitting in car line, a few kids in trauma because their parents left them. I'm like, bro, if my mom left me, I'm getting whatever I want for dinner tonight. Like, you're good, bro. Like, this is a win for you. I wanted that to happen. It never did. Not that I can remember. But for Jesus, I don't think he was like left here on accident. Like Jesus would have seen the large group of people leaving, going back to Nazareth, but he stayed intentionally. He stayed in the temple. And I believe he did because there's a lot of insight for us to learn from 12-year-old Jesus, learning who the Son of God is. And so just like sub points to this, we have to know Jesus. There's two things about Jesus that are non-negotiable. Like if you're gonna call yourself a Christian, a Bible-believing Christian, 
you have to believe that Jesus really was fully God and fully man. And so if you're taking notes, that's sub point, he's fully God first. Where do we see that? Again, his parents, they realize a day into their journey, Jesus ain't here. And so they go back to Jerusalem. They're trying to find him. After three days total, they find him. They're like, son, where have you been? We've been stressed out of our minds. And Jesus says, did you not know I must be in my father's house? If you're like me, I always like, like to think about when would Jesus have known like that he was the son of God? Did he always know? Did he like just, did it click at some point? And while we can't know for sure, through Jesus' first words ever recorded, we see that Jesus knows he is the son of God at the age of 12. And then there's like some other stuff. He just has so much knowledge. It's like maybe special because he's God's son. And it's hard to explain who this is. And then when I even think about it more, it's like there's tension here. It's like, okay, this is, he's God. How could he really be man? How can both of these things be true? And Paul does a great job. There's a few verses I want us to read in Philippians chapter two. They'll be on the screen. Paul says this, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so we see this. Now, I don't think there's a better passage to explain this side, like the essence of Jesus, than this right here. Verse number seven says that Jesus emptied himself so he could come down to earth. And there's a lot of like misconceptions about what that means. Some people read that and they're like, okay, this is where Jesus had to give up some of his divinity, some of what made him God so he could come to earth. Like he couldn't just be all powerful. He couldn't know everything. So this verse means that he gave that up. He emptied himself of that so he could come to earth. However, we don't believe that is true at all. Jesus being fully God, he didn't empty himself of his divinity. He emptied himself of the glory that he deserved. Like think about this, Jesus in heaven on the throne, he deserved all the praise, all the worship, angels worshiped him and he emptied himself of the glory he was due to take on the form of a man. That's so humbling to think about. That's the challenge here to be humble because of that. But it says equality with God was something that could have been grasped. He could have had that because he was God, but he didn't access it. He emptied himself and came down in the form of a man. I think the most helpful way for me to think through it is this. Like in this equation, in this formula, there really is no subtraction. There's only addition. What I mean is God, Jesus in heaven, didn't remove 50% of his humanity or 50% of his divinity to pick up humanity. No, fully God, he only added human flesh. 100% God, 100% man. So then, okay, fully God, now fully man. Where do we see that here? In verse number 52, it says that he grew in wisdom and stature and in knowledge. So him being fully human, he thought like a human, he talked like a human. He had to learn to walk and talk. Jesus had to learn how to like use tools as a carpenter. Jesus got sad. Jesus got tired. Like Jesus too, took naps. And I'm like, that is so good. Like I love to hear that. That's encouraging to me. But all these things, and then we see he grew in stature. And this is where I really start thinking. I'm like, Jesus, he could have came down as like a full grown man, like started his ministry right away, but he chose to take on the form of a baby, which means some, for some reason, God chose to willingly live through those awkward middle school years. 
I'm like, that is beyond me. Like, that is crazy. Then I'm starting to think, like, did Jesus ever have that awkward haircut? Did Jesus' voice ever crack? Like, what, how much did, did Jesus really experience? Then I'm like, okay, well, what if Jesus came around today? Like, would Jesus have had social media? Like, would Jesus have posted all the cringy stuff that I see other kids posting today? This is going to be a real moment of vulnerability for me, all right? My mom let me have Facebook as a third grader because I wanted to play Farm Town. And so she let me have Facebook, whatever. How many of y'all get like Facebook memories still? Like they pop up? I get Facebook memories. However, I get Facebook memories of the stuff I was posting as a nine and 10 year old. And so I'm just gonna share some of this content on the screen. I was born in 2000. And so the year you see it posted, that's how old I am. So some of these things I was posted, just wanted the world to know, I just jogged a mile and a half nonstop. Also, I'm gonna apologize for my grammar and capitalization up front as a 10 year old. Next, today I had to mow the grass for the first time. So tired frowny face. All right, let's keep going. This is where it gets good. I'm so mad. It said in the newspaper that I made all A's and B's, but I didn't. I made all A's and I have my report card to prove it. All caps, so mad. I must have been really upset that day. Then this is where, okay, I'm so bored. I'm not going to read a book, so don't comment, read a book. There are nine comments. I can almost guarantee you all of them said, read a book. Uh, a few more. Got to rate the yard front and back. <laughs> okay, that's fun. Uh, I ate Red Lobster last night. Today I have to play a football game at 10.15. Just boom, just want everybody to know my life. The last one, uh, going to David Smith's house. I'm so happy because all I was doing was playing the Wii against my little brother. It gets boring because I always win. Poor Ryan, my brother's here, boom roasted, got him. Uh, but yeah, I'm just like, I read that. I'm like, would Jesus have done this? And I'm like, I don't think that was sinful. So like maybe, like if he lived in that time, I don't know. But why, why does all of, like that matter. Jesus gives us an example to follow in his humanity. I love the way that our executive pastor of spiritual formation, Stephen Williams, put it. He said, Jesus came to earth not to show us how to be God. He came to earth to show us how to be human. Man, I, we have an example in Jesus. And so on the one hand, there's so much in Jesus that I cannot imitate. And in those areas, we have to learn to trust him. For example, like I could have never paid the price for my own sin. I could have never taken God's wrath on myself. Jesus is the only way. I cannot imitate that. So in the ways I can't be him, I trust him in that completely. And that's maybe where some of us are at this morning. You need to put your faith and trust in Jesus for the first time. However, for others of us, we have done that. And now there's an example to follow. Jesus increased, Jesus grew, not in a way that he was somehow wrong and needed to be made right. No, Jesus grew in a way that he was, it was incomplete. God's plan for his life was incomplete and he needed to complete it. In that same way, man, I'm just encouraged by the fact that like God has a plan for me and God has a plan for you. And so that, that leads us to our final point that we have to walk with Christ. Like, what is, what is God's plan for my life? How should I grow? We should grow in the same way that Jesus needed to grow. In wisdom, in stature, and in favor with God and man. Like, I see that and I'm like, more than anything, if Jesus needed to grow in a certain way, I can believe that Brandon needs to. Like, I want to imitate that to the best of my possible abilities. And I know this is the temptation. The temptation is to believe that somehow Jesus had it easier. Like, because he was God, like, he was somehow able to overcome it. He had some sort of slight advantage. And I don't, I actually don't think that's true. Hebrews 4, 14 through 16, it's going to be on the screen. It says this, since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, coming down to earth, Jesus, the son of God, let us hold fast to our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. What's so encouraging to me is that Jesus didn't like perfectly complete the plan that God had for him because he was bigger than all of the circumstances because he didn't have to walk through temptation. It's actually quite the opposite. 
Like Jesus went through more temptation than you and I could ever experience because Jesus never gave in. We gave in, temptations cut short. Jesus experienced the fullest weight of temptation. Jesus knows what it's like to lose a loved one. Jesus knows what it's like for somebody so close to you to betray you. Jesus knows what it's like to be the recipient of something that's so unfair. Jesus experienced the emotions of all of that in his humanity. And so as we're trying to grow with Jesus and you fail and you hurt, Jesus, I believe Jesus hurts with you. He's not somebody off in the clouds who says, you just gotta get over it. Like, you just gotta rub some dirt on it. No, Jesus is saying, like, I've actually felt what you feel and I hurt with you. This is, this is the Jesus that I want at the forefront of our minds going into 2024. One who cares, a Jesus that just deeply sympathizes with you. This is what he says. This is our confidence in walking with him and drawing close to him. So going to 2024, the same Jesus that we're gonna learn about who is so victorious, who restores all justice with just the word of his mouth, that's the Jesus who also hurts with you in your lowest moments. The Jesus who, who has won, who says it is finished. I believe he cares for you in like your daily defeat that you walk through. Like this is Jesus. And this Jesus, again, he grew in knowledge. He overcame temptation and he did it perfectly. And so I see that and I'm like, I want to grow like this. Like I want to imitate like this, imitate him like this to the best of my ability. I wanna grow in wisdom. I wanna grow in favor with God and man. So we look to Jesus. How did Jesus do it? And, and not just how do you do it, is this like an actual plan that I can follow? Is there something I can imitate here? And I do believe it's possible. And it starts with what we see about Jesus's heart. Like Jesus's heart was to know the things of his father. He goes to the temple, he sits underneath the, the priest's teaching, he's asking questions. And then I think we see that he was giving answers because he had already been drowning himself in understanding who God is. Like he was completely consumed with knowing the scriptures and knowing God. And what's even more amazing, if you think about it, this wasn't Jesus at the age of 30. Like this was Jesus as a 12 year old boy, which in this time period, this would have been when he would have had to make his faith his own as he's stepping into manhood. And Jesus, more than anything, he just wants to, he's, he just wants wisdom. He wants to understand who God is. I'm just gonna take a time out to read one of my favorite verses. Philippians 3, seven through eight says, but whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I've suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Paul here simply is just telling us this, knowing Jesus, growing with Jesus is worth more than anything else this world has to offer. If you read the context, he just gave us a list of all the things he's great at. This is why he's awesome. And he says that is garbage in comparison to knowing who Jesus is. And so I get back to the story and I'm like, where did, where did this happen? Like, when did Jesus really develop a heart to know the things of God, to get into the scriptures? And I believe so confidently the precedent was set by Jesus's parents. Again, his earthly parents, Mary and Joseph. It says in the text that they made it to Jerusalem every single year for the feast of Passover. They were devout Jews. And again, knowing Jesus in his humanity, he had to learn from somewhere. I think he saw the example of his parents and I believe that spurred him on. I think Mary and Joseph's life just rang of one that's saying, God is worth it. Like he's worth knowing. And so parents, just to, as we sit here and think for a second, is this the message that is being preached in your families? 
Like I think everybody with our mouth would say, God is someone worth knowing. Like reading your Bible is good. Going to church is a good thing. However, like what is the message that our life is preaching? I think oftentimes, not all the time, but oftentimes, vacation is more important. Like their sports dreams, our kids' sports endeavors are more important. Sometimes rest is just more important. And then we start thinking about community. We're like, hey, it's so important that you have good friends, you have good community, but nothing like nothing in our life says that we value that ourselves. And so parents, in a moment of vulnerability and examining your heart, just in your seat, look back on 2023. Did your example as the leader of your household preach a message that said Jesus is worth everything? Looking back at 2023, not just your words, your actions, the way you led, the way you lived your life in front of your kids. Does your life proclaim a message saying that knowing Jesus is better than anything else this world has to offer? But then students in the room, kids in the room, what's so encouraging to me too is that this is, again, this is Jesus at the age of 12, like completely consumed by the things of God. And like one of, my, one of my joys in student ministry is watching students fall in love with reading God's word. Like there's a group of them right now, a group of ninth graders that I don't even know if they've missed a day of reading their Bible in a year and a half. Like two middle school fall retreats ago, God just got a hold of their heart. They found Jesus as somebody worth knowing. And almost every day on Snapchat, I'm seeing them post, this is what I read today, this is what I read today. And I think we read that, we see that, and we're like, that's so foreign, that's so awesome. And while it is special, it's not exclusive. Like, it's, it's not unique. This is something that you can experience this year, knowing Jesus in that way. And so the question is, what, what is your strategy for 2024? I'm not sure if y'all like, like thinking through goals or don't like thinking through New Year's resolutions. I'm not gonna lie, like, I love them. Uh, I, ha- I have a bad strategy I like make 15 goals, just hoping that I'll hit seven of them. I'm like, if I do 50% of my job, I feel really good. Don't take up that strategy. It doesn't really work well. Um, However, there are some of us who are like, I've tried it. I've tried to make New Year's resolutions, and this just doesn't work. It's never stuck past February. I would just say this. Wherever you are at on that scale, you need one goal. What is your strategy for knowing Jesus better in 2024? Again, you hear it all the time. Jesus is worth it. Intellectually, you know that's a good thing that I need to put on the table. So what is your strategy? You will miss it wide open if you don't take time to specifically think about it. And I would just say reminder, like grow grow in the moment. Like if, if you're brand new to following Jesus, I would say your goal shouldn't be to read the whole Bible in the book of January. Like that would be pretty overwhelming. However, if you've been following Jesus for, for 30 years now and you can't look back and see, this is how I've grown in wisdom. Right? This is how I've grown in favor with God and man. I would say this is the year, it's time, to, it's time to turn it up a little bit. It's time to grow deeper in your relationship with Jesus. And I think there's two ways we have to think through. What does my time with God look like in community? And so the first thing, Some of us have never read our Bibles consistently. And this is the year you know it's time to make that a habit. Like whether it's a chapter a day, whether it's just 10 minutes a day, whether it is reading the Bible reading plan that we're offering as a church, it's time to spend time in God's word. And I would say get specific. Like get a notepad out, take some notes on your phone, write when you're gonna do it, where you're gonna do it, and make Make a clean, specific strategy for how you're gonna know Jesus better through his word. For some of us, it's it's prayer. Again, I know for a lot of us, prayer is just a hard thing. And this is the year, you're gonna start journaling your prayers. Like you just gotta try something different. Maybe this will work. Maybe you'll concentrate more. Maybe you'll say, I won't turn on the radio in the car on the way to work. That will be my time with Jesus. Whatever it is, let's think through it. How am I gonna spend time with Jesus in 2024? And then community, maybe, maybe for years, you've just been pushing this off. Like you, we've always said like, get plugged into a small group. And you've just never thought that was for you. You've never really bought into it. And I would say 2024, man, it's time to surround yourself with godly community. Community that pushes you toward Jesus. 
just to put it simply, you cannot grow alone. Man, our church makes it too easy to get plugged into a small group. This is the year. You need to know Jesus better through the avenue of community. And I wish I could, I could talk more about the like specific practical side of things. And again, my prayer is that maybe as a family, maybe as a couple, you would spend some time this afternoon just writing through, how am I going to grow closer to Jesus this year? How am I going to know him better? I hope you do that this afternoon. But I know as soon as you do, the lies are gonna creep in from the enemy saying this isn't even worth it that I've got too much on my plate, I've got too much on my schedule, convincing you this is something that can wait until later. This is something I don't really need. There's more important things in my life right now. Those, all those thoughts will start creeping in, I guarantee it, if you take this seriously. And I just wanna remind you of some things that you already know to think through as those thoughts come in. But the first one, the Jesus that you are giving up time to know, this Jesus is truly knowable. Someone who wants friendship with you so deeply that he would give up a throne in heaven to have it. The Jesus that you are giving up maybe 10 minutes for, 20, 30 minutes for this year, that's the same Jesus who went to every extent even death on a cross, to have a relationship with you. This is the Jesus you're giving up just 20 minutes a day to know better this upcoming year. The one that we plead with you to spend time with him in prayer. This is the Jesus who listens, who cares, who hurts with you in your hurt. The Jesus who has the power to do something about your prayers. I believe this, if you gave Jesus one year, 2024 was the first year that you, you sought to know him, that you searched for him with all of your heart, I know you would look back on 2024 and say, Jesus proved to be the greatest treasure this world has to offer. And that, that's just my challenge for us today. There is no better way to spend this next year than falling more in love with the person of Jesus. Let's pray. Jesus, I love you so much. And I'm just thankful for today. God, I'm thankful for the people in this place. God, for the person in this room who doesn't know you, who is far from you, God, would you just draw them near to yourself and this be the day they see you as, as just worth surrendering everything to first and foremost, God. But also Jesus, I pray for the believer in this room the believer in this room who feels like they've been stuck in their faith for years, God, who feels like they don't know what to do to get out. And I'm just praying that you would start to stir in their heart and their affections a desire to know you so much deeper. God, that this afternoon, the men in here would lead their families in a strategy to knowing you better in 2024. God, I believe this, but I'm just pleading with you, God, for the people in this room, for the people of Upstate Church, would you just prove to be the best treasure this world has to offer this upcoming year as we just yearn and plead to know you deeper. God, we love you so much. We ask this in your son, Jesus Christ's name.